Greetings, citizens of Nerdtropolis. Sean Todd here, the mayor of Nerdtropolis, and on this episode of Real Insights, my guest is the extremely talented Anjali Bimani. Hello, hello. Hello, Anjali. Excited to chat with you today. I am excited to chat with you. Yeah, so I think it's safe to say that you are a nerd. I'm a nerd. We're both nerds, I believe. So I must ask first, what do you nerd out most about? Lately, it's mostly about TTRPGs and and Dungeons and Dragons and all the role playing games that I play. Um, that's that's been my uh, my current obsession. Um, so that for sure, Star Trek, absolutely. I grew up with uh, both the original and the Next Generation, um, and have had the great joy of meeting many of the cast members, um, including the late great uh Nichelle Nichols before she passed away and uh so that that it's it's been like such a way of life in our family for so many years and I'm just waiting waiting for the teleporter and the replicator I just need those I don't need the holodeck I just need those two I need to not have to cook and I need to be able to get anywhere at any given moment those things are simple um, <laughs> I love uh, that but yeah, that, those two things, um, uh, uh, what else am I nerding out about? I mean, I feel like I nerd out, I kind of nerd out about everything in my life because I, I get really excited about it and then I want to do a deep dive, you know, and I feel like being a nerd really is just about having a tremendous amount of knowledge and passion about one particular thing. It's just that sometimes that particular thing is not necessarily mainstream, so people call you a nerd. But like ultimately, uh, you know, if you're a math nerd, you love math. If you're a if you're a fitness nerd, you study fitness. So it's uh, what else am I nerding out about? Um, dogs. I I am nerding. I have always been nerding out about dogs. It's my thing. Um, ever since I got a dog, I will read anything and everything there is about the health of that dog because I need him to last a nice long time. Yeah, so you got a good uh, diversity when it comes to nerding out. I love that. I have a, a confession to make. I've never played. D and D, I always seen people play it. I've always seen it on shows and movies. How does one really get into D? &D? What's the best way to jump into D and D? So it, it's, it's, I'm so glad that you asked that because I think that a lot of people think that the barrier to entry is that there's so much to read and so much to learn. And I like to describe it as um, D and D and all TTRPGs for the most part are open book tests. You have a rule book, but nobody's saying like, you can't look at the rule book while you're playing. No, it's an open book test with all the friends of yours that are playing as well. So I would honestly, I feel like the best way to get in is just, or the best way to start is to talk to your friends and see who's playing and ask them, hey, can I join your game? Uh, your home games, my friend, I really want to try. Most people, at least in my experience, I get thrilled when someone's like, I really want to learn how to play D&D, &D, but I don't know how. And I'm like, please come, come to our game. I will bring you in and it will be so, exci so exciting. And I find that people who are new players, particularly because they don't know what they don't know, have really creative ways of spinning the story and playing the game. And it really is, it's just a storytelling game. Um, you just have the rules and the structure as a device to help you with the storytelling and to inspire you. You know, does your character succeed at the thing you want to do or does, do they fail and how do you tell the story of that? Um, and it's very collaborative. So uh, uh, I, I have yet to be at a table where people aren't helpful and fun and excited to bring someone in. Yeah, I've been dying to do that. I, I don't know. I guess I need to just suck it up and really find someone to play with and learn about it. There's also There are also so many role-playing games out there. It doesn't have to be D&D. &D. When I came back to playing role-playing games, because I played, I started playing D&D &D when I was eight, and then I stopped probably after high school for a long period of time. When I came back to playing, um, I came back on a show called We're Alive Frontier playing a game system called Outbreak Undead. It was like a zombie apocalypse role-playing game system. So really, there are so many different game systems, and there are, there are even board games that sort of replicate the role-playing game process process. Um, uh, I have a friend, Jane Chung Hoffaker, who has created, I'm pointing at it over here like you can see it, who uh, her company created a, a game called Kinfire Chronicles, which is sort of like the board game for role playing gamers. And so it's a real, there are all sorts of fun things to do. You don't have to pick one thing. Um, and there, there are no wrong answers. It's a game. All of them are games. Yeah, they're all different themes too and different IPs they involve. Like it's really cool to see all the variety out there. Absolutely. Like you can absolutely like there are cyberpunk games, there are zombie apocalypse games, there are history games, there are fantasy games, you name it, it's out there. Yeah, I love it. I have a lot of friends that do play a bunch of things. So I just need to 
buy my schedule free, make it free and, and that, do them. Honestly, that is the hard, the, the biggest challenge to playing these games is scheduling. <laughs> finding <laughs> time when you and at least four of your friends uh, can actually get together and play. Uh, although I, I, I'm in a home game right now where our DM maintains, he's like, I don't care if two of you show up, we're playing. So, <laughs> uh, so that's very, very cool. No, I love that. And, and, you know, it's no secret that you have been part of so many amazing shows, video games, other projects. I mean, you've done it all. It's amazing. You have a favorite project that you've been a part of that you worked on that's the most memorable to you? So yeah, I don't do favorites um, because I can't. Uh, there are so many different reasons to love so many different things. And and my brain explodes when I try to pick a favorite thing. What's I've the most been... memorable one for you? I, I can't pick again. That's most anything I can't pick. Um, I've had so many incredible ones. My first Broadway show was a show called Metamorphoses, um, and it was set in a pool of water, and it was all a, a series of Greek myths that we were performing on Broadway. And we had started in this tiny theater in Chicago, making like two hundred bucks a week and freezing our holes off. And then we went to, uh, and then it ended up growing into something that went to Broadway. So it was a very big and 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 informative part of my life, and then those cast members and the director Mary Zimmerman are friends for life because of it and so that was an inc that was the first probably big memorable um acting experience that I can remember obviously Ms Marvel uh because it was just a joy from start to finish to do that show and to play with that cast and that crew and the creatives and everyone was so extraordinary and it was such a labor of love for so many people and such an important thing for so many people I was excited to watch it let alone be in it so it was just that that was an extraordinary experience um all of the stuff that i've done with critical role and dimension 20 has been great almost every role-playing game show that i've done has had at least one if not several very like that's gonna stick with me moments whether they were emotional highs or very tragic moments or just moments where we connected so well as players um all of those have been fantastic um uh, right now, they sequest, which is the the role playing game show that uh, that I'm on and produced along with the folks at F and Funny and uh, Jasmine. I Bula. watched a little bit of it the other day, and now actually I'm going to go back. I'm actually hooked just watching. Just excellent. <laughs> I mean, I, what I, it's, what's super fun about it for me is that it feels like, and for us, is it feels like we're getting to invite people into our culture rather than like, let's teach you what it's like to be Indian. It's more about like, no, come play with us. This is fun. We don't know all of it either. We all have different languages than our families speak. Come join us. We'll tell you what the inside jokes are about. You will not be left out. Um, I, I love that about the show. It's, it's just, it feels as inclusive as we wanted it to be. Yeah, it looks like you're having a, a tons of fun. And that's what I love about it. Everyone's laughing, giggling, and uh, yeah. being silly. And that's what I love about that. And, you know, you mentioned Miss Marvel, which, you know, as a mayor of Neutropolis, I'm a big Marvel fanatic, obviously. Uh, just a couple of days ago, I actually met Kevin Feige. Uh, oh, hey, he's he, so sweet. Oh, he is so awesome. And so I had to thank him for, you know, the MCU, because to be honest, Neutropolis really wouldn't exist to what it is today without the birth of the MCU and creating oh. this big big thing in the world of cinema and TV with superheroes was awesome. But how was it like when you got that phone call that you're gonna be part of the Miss Marvel series? I mean, I don't even know how to describe it because part of it was, it was, it was kind of hilarious to me because I was like, I always want to be a part of the Marvel universe. How cool. And then I was like, of course I'm going to be an auntie in the Marvel universe. That makes perfect sense. That tracks. Um, but I was, I was ridiculously excited. You know, again, Marvel is very, they keep everything close to the chest. So I didn't entirely know what my part was going to be. I knew I was playing auntie Ruby, but I didn't really know what that would entail long-term until I got there and got on set and started to see the lines and the, and the scripts. Um, but I was just, uh, it sort of felt like one of those moments where you're like, okay, what other incredible thing is about to pop out? Like this is, how is that, how is that happening? Um, and then getting to set with everybody and, and, and just feeling, you know, the fact that there were no like giant A-list names in the show, I think actually contributed to the fact to, that all of us became so tight and that it became such a like a familial feeling on set in addition to the fact that we were celebrating family in the show so much and community in the show so, so much um so yeah it was just it was one of those things where you're like 
sure, that's crazy and amazing and I'm in. Um, you know, I, I felt that way when Overwatch happened and we didn't know it was going to blow up and uh, and then it did and we're like, okay, awesome. Um, and then it just got better and better with the Marvel stuff. Every time I met someone who was working on the show or then when I eventually met Kevin and Lewis and and um, yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty darn cool thing to check off the list. Yeah, y'all did a great job. You created a family, a community that was so real, uh, authentic. So I'm assuming, is there a group chat amongst the Khan family? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, not one that I am on, but you know what? I'm, I'm not one of the kids. They might, like the, 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 the youngins might have one. Um, uh, I'm in touch with a lot of them one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, but not there's no like family WhatsApp, although there is a family WhatsApp for like every Indian person and every Pakistani person I know. Um, That's so, very true. <laughs> yeah. How is it like to have uh, Iman Balani on the uh, set? She, um, you know, from the first moment I, I met her, she was so grounded. You know, there was something so very like, I'm here, I'm doing my job. Um, but then as I, as I gradually got to spend more time with her, I really got to get a sense of what an extraordinary young woman she is. Um, uh, you know, obviously she's incredibly talented. That goes without saying, we've all seen her perform, but she's got such a good head on her shoulders and she's such a hard worker. And she's, I, I just, she's, she's nothing but lovely. I'm so glad I've said this so many times. I'm so glad that she's so young so we can watch her for many, many, many years to come. Yeah. It's, it's exciting fun. to see her grow. And you know, she's a nerd too. She nerds out about this stuff. No, she nerds out. Oh my God. I love she's, it. She's got, like, she goes deep. She goes deep, deep. And I love that about her. And it couldn't be a more perfect story um, that she became our Ms. Marvel because it's it's sort of like she is, she was living that life already. Um, and now she gets to have the superpowers to go with it. Yeah, she's perfect for that role. And I have to mention this as, you know, it's 2024. It, this month marks the 25th anniversary of The Sopranos, which oh. you got to be a part of. Yeah, this month. I it's know that. That's amazing. Wow. And you're part of the Sopranos legacy. So, I am. <laughs> how was your experience with that? It was incredible. It was my second television job. Um, and everyone on set was so gracious and so helpful and so kind. And without spoiling anything, the particular storyline that I was a part of was a very intense one and a very dramatic one. And um, even as the actors were having to put themselves in those places, they, they somehow found a way to still be as present and, and, and kind and gracious as they could, but still have, you know, be able to take their focus and put it back in the place that they needed it to be, to be able to get to the places that they were. So it was a really fantastic lesson in how to handle yourself on set um, and be careful and be protective of your artistic process while also still being kind and nice and connected to the people in the room. Um, and, uh, and that was, it was, it was, pretty darn cool. Plus I got to show off that my parents are both doctors. So I know how to like make it look like I knew how to make it look like I was doing what I was doing, uh, which was very, very helpful to get that, that help from them and from my sister-in-law, who's also a doctor. It's quite a family of doctors. Um, but yeah, that was, that was again, one of those moments where someone calls and says, okay, so you have a job on the Sopranos right in the final season. And you're like, okay, that sounds amazing. What other amazing thing is going to happen? Yeah, you've been a part of a lot of amazing shows. Uh, the list of everything you've been on is amazing. But I also love that your your voice is in Kung Fu Panda, The Dragon Knight, We Baby <laughs> Bears. Yeah. I, I sometimes watch We Baby Bears because I love the We Bear Bears, and so they're so cute. Yeah, it's just something so about them cute. I love. Oh my god, no, they are they are sheer happy making. The gif of the bear walking that's out there, I just use that all the time because it's just adorable. It's such a great show. Yeah, animation's just great. I just love that we have that art form and you pro provide some great voices. And also you're in the legend of Vox Machina, which is really cool. Yes. Yeah, well, those those folks are, I mean, they're such extraordinary creators and incredible human beings. And so all of their success is just, it's always so fun to watch when, when great things are happening to great people who work hard and are very talented, right? And when you're close to them on top of it, it's just icing on the cake. Um, uh, uh, and the fact that they got to do that series with that incredible Kickstarter, and I mean, such a testament to just the world that they have created being inclusive and inviting and people grabbing it and running down the field with it. So um, I love watching the show. I'm excited, hopefully for the Mighty Nine, which is going to be like coming out. I know they're doing they're doing that series. So uh, they just have nothing but incredible things down the pike. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, I love that show. And I, I love everything, like everything you've done. I just love, <laughs> you know, you're part of so I'm many very, very lucky. I'm very, very lucky that I, I have learned um, through experience for better or for worse, that the answer is to follow the joy. <clears throat> if you are having a good time, you're doing something right. And if you are miserable, you are, you are, you are, there is a great disturbance in the force. There's got to be a way to figure out how to make what you're doing, even when it's difficult, because my version of fun might be difficult, different than your version of fun. My version of fun may be doing, you know, a Shakespearean tragedy for three hours and, and ripping my heart out and someone else might, you know, that might make someone else want to stick a fork in their eye. So I, I have really learned um, that if I can, if I can feel the joy uh, around me and enjoy the process, then the, it's wide open. The, the world is wide open. You hear so many people, you know, we're in awards season right now and you, you hear so many people giving those speeches and talking and, and just saying to people, you can do it, stay the course. I promise you can do it. People wanting to uplift people and remind them that even when it's tough, there is joy to be had here. And awards are great, but that's not what this is about. This is about staying the course and making the thing and doing the thing and doing it with great people. If you have that level of enthusiasm that you can stick with, that, that feels like, at least so far, that feels like a, an excellent compass for me to follow. Yeah, you've been doing a lot of great things. And I'm not the avid gamer that I used to be, but you I mean, you're big in the video game world with Overwatch and Apex Legend. You know, what's different about voicing in video games and voicing, you know, an animated series? I'd say probably the biggest difference is the fact that generally speaking, so in video games, you have kind of, kind of two essential kinds of things. You have what are called cut scenes, which are like, actual scenes that you are acting with other actors and like it's a it's a narrative scene but then there are also more commonly uh, uh like battle chatter or or pings or things like that which are just a series of lines that are triggered by something else in the game so you will go into a voiceover session and you'll have like 300 lines that you're just going to go through and do three takes of every single one and your voice director and hopefully the narrative director will be there and other people and they will give you guidelines as to what's happening in that situation. But ultimately you are going through those lines on like independent of seeing the animation seeing what's going on. Uh, more often than not you're doing it alone you're not you're not in the room with another actor or even if you're interacting with them on that line. Um, so there it is much more theater of the mind. Uh, than, than necessarily when you get the, the joy of being able to do an animated series or an animated uh, uh, movie where you get to be in the room with other people sometimes. Yeah, and I know everyone, uh, every time they see you, they, they always tell about your fav their favorite video game, you're in, you know, <laughs> which is Aww, awesome. I love that. I love that. I mean, I look, I grew up playing games too. I uh, When first person shooters came out, I finally had to bow out because I was like, I don't have the coordination for that action. So I feel a little embarrassed, but I also, this is the truth. I'm very, very bad at Overwatch. I can play it, but I'm bad at it. Apex, I can't get past the training module, can't even figure it out. So I am very good at, at, at enjoying the lore. Because I think all of these games, especially like, I feel like there's a real movement now in video gaming to creating these very unique and and uh, intricately woven characters and their backstories. And I love that because there's so much complexity now, rather than them being two dimensional characters, they may just be on the screen, but they have a full life. And so I love getting deep into the lore of all the characters in video games because game developers are extraordinary the amount of work they do the amount of focus they have to have the amount of time they spend on a game you know when we finished uh, uh spider-man 2 they had been working on that for like five years that's a lot of time to be working on one project that is going to come out you know i'm i'm a little all over the place but what they do is really that's extraordinary they pretty much make playable movies is what they are you know absolutely, absolutely. well spider-man for sure I mean, I just I watched uh, we had a little gathering of the cast and crew to watch a lot of the cutscenes, and I was watching all of them and I'm like, this is this is a movie like I don't. This is a movie. This is absolutely a movie. Um, the performances were so extraordinary. Um, you know, I feel that way about The Last of Us. I feel that way about so many different games. Yeah, uh, I love the first Spider-Man game. I haven't had time to pick up the new one, and I'm a big Spider-Man dork, uh, so I'm looking forward to that. I've got to talk to uh, Tony Todd, who voices uh, Venom in that game, so I'm yeah. excited to just experience that and everything else. Uh, but also, wait till you meet Craven. Yeah, that too, and I'm excited because that's actually one of my favorite uh, villains. It's Craven. Yeah, he's, he's he did an extraordinary job. 
Yeah. yeah, there's so many great villains for Spider-Man. I think that has probably the best rogue gallery ever is Spider-Man. Yeah, definitely. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, the rogues gallery in Spider-Man, <laughs> that goes deep. And then second for me might be Batman, because Batman has a pretty solid one, too. <laughs> yeah. But um, you're working on a new project called the B-Ward, which seems like super interesting. Ah, Can you talk about that? Because I want to learn more. I'm absolutely. I'm intrigued by this. So um, my friend Sabina Vesla is an extraordinary screenwriter. Um, I just produced her, her a short film that we're working on of hers as well. And um, she, when we first met, she, and I just fell in love with her in the moment, like we automatically just became good friends, but she shared with me this beautiful script and beautiful idea uh, for a show called The B Word, which is a story of, of five friends um, who also happen to be of South Asian American descent or, or varieties thereof or mixes thereof. And they're very, very tight knit. They're very close, but one of them is a powder keg always waiting to explode and, and creates a lot of drama. And there's a lot of there's a lot of deep, deep stuff that we're dealing with. It's a black comedy, but we're also dealing with a lot of issues that don't get talked about in the South Asian community, things like mental health, things like interracial marriage that sometimes you know, highlights the, I hate to say it, but racism within another culture, um, the the uh, drug addiction, all of it, you know, dealing with all of those things. And it's still a comedy and it's still light. So uh, she has written these beautiful, beautiful characters, again, very unique, very, um, very intricately woven, a sum of many, many different parts. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to getting it out in the world. Yeah, it, it seems super interesting and something I'm definitely going to watch when it does come out. You know, lastly, I have to ask you, you've done so much, like it's impossible to count. You know, what's on that list of goals of yours that you're you're looking forward to accomplishing? Action movie or action series. That's it. That's number one. That's number one on the list. We're going to have you do your own stunts too in these action Absolutely. movies? Absolutely. <laughs> She says, knowing that that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> of course, I'm going to do it. Hey, look, I did my own stunts. I did a show called um, uh, Lone Star 911, where I had to hang upside down from a, a, what do you call it? A fire engine, the back of a fire engine. I was like, sure, why not? So uh, if it's stunts I can do, I'm absolutely do. I'm no Tom Cruise. Like, I'm not going to do that kind of stuff. But uh, but I'll do whatever I can. You know, we'll see. We got to get you into that. I'm excited. So I'm excited. What else are you going to deliver to us when it comes to animation, video games, movies, and series? There's a lot of fun stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff coming up. So keep an eye out. You got it. Until next time, we'll talk soon. All right. Take care. Once again, this is Sean Taj, the mayor of Nortropolis. And stay tuned for more movie news, reviews, interviews, and trailers.